welcome to Old Man Energy. I'm your host, Flint Anderson. As always, we're glad you could join us today. If this is your first time here, then I hope you find something valuable. And we ask that you share this with two people or five people or 10 people that you think would like it. Also, make sure that you like and subscribe. That way you don't miss any of the weekly episodes that drop every Thursday. Also, we put shorts out randomly. And please go follow me on all social media because attention is what drives this train. So I put different content on the different platforms daily. So today I want to talk about fear. And I know that a few episodes ago that we had talked specifically about fear and how to deal with it. I really left a huge part of it out because I wanted to address that separately and specifically. I want to talk to you about talking to your children about fear. And I'm going to skip over the younger children, the demographic of toddlers to maybe eight to 10 years old. I'll find the link and put it on here to the talk that Fred Rogers gives about fear specifically for that age group. And I I can't do better than him. He, um, he adds a sense of comfort that just is exemplary. There's, you won't ever top that. That will tell you how to talk to your young children about fear, but I'm going to talk to you about how to talk to your kids, to your teenagers, to your young adult children about fear, because we have a lot of turmoil in the world right now. A lot of us our age and above, we lived through the Cold War. We learned to deal with fears, not always as healthy as we should, but we lived in a constant state of fear. We grew up in a constant state of fear, even up to the events of 9-11 and the immediate aftermath of that. There was just the uncertainty was there. This new generation of young people has never lived in that. They've lived in relative security their entire life. They don't understand what's going on and that manifests itself. They don't know how to deal with it. This is not fear of, oh my goodness, I need to learn to ride a bike or I don't want to fall off my skateboard or I'm going to go bungee jumping. This is a totally different primal type of fear. And I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist at all. I'm just telling you how I feel and how I've been talking with my children and other kids that I've mentored, how they feel. It's very deep seated. It doesn't go away and they don't know how to express it. They don't even know exactly how they're feeling. And as parents, when kids have reached that age, they're either communicating with a certain or they're not. And that's more of a statement to our parenting style then it is their personality. And I get it. There's one-off kids that just don't listen no matter how good their parents are. And some kids can have really crappy parents and they're just very open communicators. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm generalizing just for the sake of generalization. You know how your kids are. You know how your kids need to be spoken to. Hopefully they still listen to you at this point. But even if they don't, it doesn't abdicate you of the responsibility of talking to them about fear and about the way they're feeling and about what's going on. And I will tell you, the war specifically overseas, the, and no matter politically how you feel, the lack of strong leadership, the lack of accountability, the, um, just the, the chaos that's going on in the world today is a problem. It's unprecedented in today's society. We're not used to it. Some of us throw back. We know how to deal with it. We know how to compartmentalize. We know how to go from there. Our kids don't. They don't have those skills. It's up to us to give it to them. The only way to give it to them is to start explaining it to them. The difference is, is that the media and what's out there on the media is completely different than it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. They have instant access to some of the most horrific images you can ever imagine, stuff that children should never see. Even though it's reality and even though it's the truth, there are just certain things that that kids don't need to be exposed to. They can be told about, they can be told about the atrocities, and this is not hiding things from them. This is allowing them to mature in a safe environment and to learn to deal with this before they're actually exposed to it. But they don't have that anymore. There are websites, and you're not going to stop it, unfortunately, unless you take social media away, and even then you're not going to stop it. Um, I dealt with that with one of our children, Des, and I had particular challenges keeping her off the Internet. And it was for other reasons, but it just if they want to get on there, they're going to find a way. Their friends at school are going to show them or whatever. So rather than pretend that that doesn't exist, you have to deal with what's going on. X in particular has many uncensored videos. The kids can watch beheadings. They can watch murder. They can watch even more horrific acts than that. And I didn't think that was possible until I logged into X and saw what was posted on there. It's terrible. And they share this. 
around like trading cards with their friends and it becomes a, I don't know, a sense of status. Oh, have you seen this? Oh, have you seen that? Well, yeah, but I've got this video here that's much grosser. And they, on the surface level, they get desensitized to it, but on a more macro level, they don't know how to deal with that. Couple that with the news media that right or wrong, and again, this is not a political post, this is just specifics and just how I feel about what's going on. Right or wrong with whatever's going on with the news media, they're driven by advertising. Happy, happy stories do not keep eyeballs on the screen. They don't make their advertisers happy. The more sensational the story, the more graphic the story, that's what keeps the advertisers paying the money. And they all try and outdo each other because they want more eyeballs on their screen. So as a result, you end up with this other warped, skewed version of what's going on. It may be true. It may not be true. You can watch the same story across three different networks and get three different versions of the story. Or you can watch it across 10 and they all are saying the exact same thing, depending on how they're affiliated, depending on what advertising is driving them. I think that's a problem, but it's a different problem for today. So we have social media, which exposes these kids to horrific things. We have the regular media, which is exposing the kids to horrific things with the intent to shock. And then we have these kids trying to figure out what's going on because now they hear their parents, if you're not talking to your kids about this, they hear your parents saying things because they're angry. They're either angry that their tax money is being sent overseas to fund these wars they don't believe in, or they do believe in one side or the other in the war. So the other, the other side that they don't agree with is the bad guys. But these kids might be confused because they don't understand why that one side is the bad guys. And they've seen videos that they were told is from the bad guys, but it's actually the good guys. Listen, in war, there is no good guy. There is no bad guy. There are people defending their beliefs in their homelands. There are terrorists and there are some people out there that just want to watch the world burn. That's not generally the rule whenever you get into a land dispute. Again, not going to get into the politics of what's going on either in any of the places where there's conflict right now. The point is, is that this is a very scary time to be alive. And when you have horrific images that you're being shown, horrific news reports that you're being shown that are different sizes, you, so you couple these images with those news reports, and then you hear your parents being angry at one particular side or the other. And we tend to, as humans, when we're angry, we tend to rationalize it and we devolve into the meanest language that we possibly can find and it's usually against who or what we're angry at very confusing time for our children so it's very important that you watch what you say around your kids i'm not telling you to ignore it i'm not telling you not to say how you feel because that's absolutely critical mind how you say how you feel and what you feel because you are sending signals to them the other thing is is whether they want to listen to you or not sit down with them and talk to them Ask them how they're feeling about the situation. Ask them what they think. Ask them what they're seeing. And don't be mad at them. This is not a time to punish them for looking at stuff they're not supposed to be looking at or what have you. This is a time for true open communication. Because if you do punish them, if you do get angry about what they've been exposing themselves to, they're not going to tell you the truth. And if they don't tell you the truth, then they're not going to tell you what their fears are. And this doesn't only apply to the times of strife or war or anything else, you really want to talk to your kids about what their fears are anyway, because fear is generally what motivates us. It makes us run away from the things we don't want to deal with, or it makes us respond in very odd ways. We've got a lot of protests on college campuses now. Again, whether you believe it or not, whether you, what side, whatever side you believe on, the protests are a result of fear. They, they believe that somebody's wrong, somebody's doing something wrong, and so they're acting out. It's a pressure cooker, so to speak. I think I heard somebody in the media refer to it as that. Just waiting to explode because they have all of this energy. They have no idea how to deal with it. And they're going to focus on the first thing that they're told to focus on. They're going to go research it. And because we live in an echo chamber, as soon as they start looking for that, everything that they're exposed to across all platforms reinforces that belief, whether it's right or whether it's wrong. So you may be up against that in talking with your children. There's no good answer for this, except to get your children really talking to you. And if you want your children to really talk to you, then you need to listen to them. You need to talk to them about what they're afraid of. You need to open up and they don't want to think that they're afraid. They're going to believe that they're right. So you want to get them talking. Just get them talking about what's going on and find out how they feel. Find out how they feel about what's going on. If they're so stuck in one mindset, and you know what? It might be a mindset that agrees with you. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that we're right. This is not about being right or wrong. This is about dealing with feelings. This is it dealing with raw emotions? Get them to tell you. Get them to open up. You want to empathize with them, but you do not want to encourage them in any particular direction because our children inherently want to please us. So if we're trying to encourage them in some direction, oh, he thinks I'm right, so I'm just going to double down on this. We need to find out how they're really feeling. And being vulnerable and talking about how we feel is not something teenagers really want to do past the point of 12 or 13. Some kids are an exception, but most of them, they don't want to talk about that. They don't even want to be having that discussion. But you need to have that discussion because when they're done, when everybody's asleep, when they're alone in the dark, whenever they really, their mind starts engaging with all of this chaos and negativity that's being spewed at them, they're going to need some sort of tool to deal with it. So whenever you're talking with them, don't be judgmental. Don't attack. Don't tell them they're wrong. You can have a discussion as to why maybe they should make a more informed decision, but don't, hey, well, you're wrong because then you're just going to shut down. And then you want to give them some tools to deal with the fear. What are those tools? I mean, heck, even as adults, and even as parents, we might need some of those tools too. Shut it off. You're not required to expose yourself to that. You can block that stuff. Explain to them how the media works, how it's driven by advertising, and encourage them to go look up other viewpoints so that they can maybe get a true idea of what's really going on. And this applies to any situation, not just a conflict overseas. And then give them some coping mechanisms. Tell them that they can focus on how they're safe here, how they're removed from the environment, how, yes, there are things that are being done and atrocities on any side. I mean, anytime there's war, nobody wins because people are dying. But that doesn't mean that they're specifically in danger at that time. So talk with them about that. Give them some coping skills. Let them know that while they can be concerned about it, they don't necessarily need to worry about it, about it coming home to their doorstep, about it knocking on their door. And if they really are concerned about it coming here or that level of conflict coming here, which may be a valid concern as well, then lay out what your plan is and what you're going to do. Make some contingency plans so you know you can come and talk to me about this. We can work through this together. We can figure out how you're feeling. We can figure out what's going to make you feel better. And every person is going to be different. Every plan is going to be different. But and once you get that level of engagement, it's absolutely critical that you don't fall into judgment, that you have a purpose and a reason, not a reason, and a plan for dealing with this. You don't want to leave it open-ended because then all you've done is you've addressed all these problems, you've addressed all these fears, and you haven't given them any coping mechanisms at all. I've given you a few coping mechanisms to give them on how to turn it off, how to calm down, how to redirect, but there's a lot. There's tons of ways of dealing with this, and there's a people way smarter than I am that have published either videos or books on how to deal with fear, how to deal with this. Child psychologists out there talk about acknowledgement, but also acceptance and how to just mitigate those feelings. Figure out what works for you guys. Figure out what works for your family. And figure out what works for your child. Because you know what? If you've got three different children, you have three different ways that they're going to cope with this. Some of them might not be bothering at all. You still need to have the discussion with them because if it actually hits them or when, they're going to need the skills. Some of them may be so concerned about it they can't function, and then you're going to have one somewhere in the middle. All three of these need to be approached separately. They may end up with the same tools, but the kids need to be approached separately. Remember that you need to tell them that you love them. You need to tell them that you're there for them. You need to tell them that they're safe. You need to tell them that they're protected. They need you now more than they ever have, especially when they're scared. And we tend to act out when we're scared, so we're not always the most lovable people when we're scared. That's okay. It's our job as parents to love our children anyway. It's our job as parents to be there for them, to protect them, and to make sure that they are safe and that they feel safe. You can do that with love. You can do that with explanation. You can do that with coping skills. And you can do that with actions. You can do that by making sure even something as simple, if it's a younger child, as simple as teaching them to make sure that the doors are locked at night, that the windows are closed and locked, make it a ritual before you go to bed. Little things like that. I don't know what works for you guys, but that may make them feel better because they know that they've checked and their home environment is safe and they now feel in control 
Because ultimately, especially the younger the children are, they feel out of control. They feel like there's nothing they can do about it. There's all this bad stuff that's happening and they're feeling kind of helpless. So anything you can do to take their mind off that feeling of helplessness and redirect it onto that feeling of security and that safe environment, then you need to do it. Guys, I love you all. I hope this helps. Please sit down and talk with your kids. Let them know that you love them, that they're safe, and that they're protected. If you have any trouble with these skills or anything related to stepping up and growing and moving forward and being more present for your family or what have you, check out the links in my bio on the Mastering Manhood course where I go over these type of skills plus a bunch of others. Registration is going to open up. Well, by the time this post, registration will be open up for the May version of the Mastering Manhood Virtual Boot Camp. It's the end of the month. You want to secure your slot on it. There's some good stuff in there you're not going to want to miss. And I expand on this particular skill in making children feel safe and cared for inside that boot camp. So check it out. Let me know your thoughts. Give us a like, a share, a follow, all the things. Love y'all. Peace.